Hi there. This is Marielle Conception, your host of the My DPC Story podcast. Have you or someone you care about ever been burned by the U.S. healthcare system? If so, you are listening to the right video, because if you are listening, chances are the answer is yes. But the U.S. spends so much on healthcare. Why are so many Americans affected personally and especially financially by the healthcare system? Shouldn't that mean we have better healthcare access and treatment options? Shouldn't it be easy for us to be able to see our doctor when we need to instead of turning to the ER or urgent care? Historically, it's been seemingly impossible to answer these questions, but now that is changing through the direct primary care movement. This video that you have tuned into will bring you into the world of direct primary care and show you how physicians all over the country are changing the way they practice so patients from all backgrounds get the high quality care they need and deserve, which makes for both happy patients and physicians. Learn even more by subscribing to the My DPC Story YouTube channel. Find us on all major podcast platforms. Find us on socials at My DPC Story and at MyDPCStory.com. There you can find resources including how to find a DPC doctor near you, conferences about DPC, DPC startup guides and advice, a store with DPC swag, and even a mapper showing where podcast guests are practicing. Thanks for tuning in to hear about this powerful movement. Now, on to the episode. Primary care is an innovative, alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever-so-relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. Direct primary care is a return to the way medicine used to be practiced and the way it should be practiced. It removes a multitude of obstacles hindering patients from receiving high-quality, cost-effective care. Direct primary care creates and restores a vibrant patient-physician relationship by which patients can receive the very care they deserve and that physicians want to provide. I am Dr. Jack Forbush of the Osteopathic Center for Family Medicine, and this is my DPC story. Dr. Jack Forbush is a graduate of Eastern Maine Medical Center's Family Medicine Residency Program and Fellowship in Neuromuscular Medicine slash Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine, having obtained his medical degree at Maine's prestigious University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. Providing the full spectrum of family medicine, he practices internal medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics, and obstetrics. His particular areas of interest include integrative and holistic medicine, applying the principles of osteopathy across the age spectrum, and the incorporation of information technology in medicine. Each year, he travels to Paraguay, offering his services to the Andrea Ritz Foundation, caring for, and enjoying the company of, Guarani of all ages. He is actively involved at the local, state, and federal levels in his capacity as the current president of the main chapter of the American College of Osteopathic Family Physicians, as well as the president of the New England Direct Primary Care Alliance. He holds active board certifications in family medicine, neuromuscular medicine slash osteopathic manipulative medicine, and integrative and holistic medicine. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Forbush. Hey, thanks a lot for taking the time out to chat with me and the honor of being on this soon to be world renowned, universally infamous podcast. Let's hope that's because DPC <laughs> becomes world renowned, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, just to put this in context for people, Dr. Forbush has taken the time out of his vacation in Costa Rica to talk with us today. So envision, you know, beautiful Costa Rica as you listen to him today. You might be able to hear the waves in the background occasionally. (laughs) That said, I want to pull us back to where you normally practice, which is a completely different environment, especially now. Yes. (laughs) 
your, your neighborhood is supposed to get terrible, terrible weather. Um, well, yeah, we call we generally we call winter our delayed summer. Um, so although my heart goes out to my Texas colleagues, what they're experiencing is um, re relatively benign for us in Maine. So for those who well, for those who don't know where Maine is, it's at the very northeast tip of the country. And uh, if you uh, most people think of New England as Boston and most people think of Maine as Bar Harbor. And I'm a couple out, I'm an hour or so kind of northwest of Bar Harbor. So our environment is um, for Mainers, let's put it that way. Specifically in Hampton, Maine, where your practice is located, what is the population like? Is it retired folks? Is it families? What, what is it like? So the population of Hampton, it's about, I'm going to say about uh, 7,000 people. And although Hampton is... Um, in some ways considered a bedroom community, if you will, for the neighboring communities of Bangor and Brewer, uh, which has a population of maybe 50 or 60,000. The overwhelming majority of my patients, when I say overwhelming, it's easily 90% are actually not bedroom community people. They're straightforward blue collar folks that run their own business. They might be you know, the general contractor or the preacher down the road or the plumber. Uh, I, I don't have my population is does not represent the actual population of Hamden in many ways, if that makes any sense. The community next to me, Bangor and Brewer, specifically Bangor, uh, serves, uh, they're, they're the tertiary uh, care center for the large medical industrial fungal complex. Um, and that serves about two thirds of the state. So even having said that, I mean, my population itself is, like I said, very blue collar people. And I pull pull folks from several hours away that will come um, to my office from Callis or Jonesport or Moose Junction or Jackman or even in the northern parts of the well, what we call the county or Rooster County. So it's it's an inter even though I'm located in kind of a bedroom community, the people I serve are not the bedroom community folks. They are the regular Joes, so to speak. Gotcha. And in terms of your demographics in your clinic, what are your demographics like, including kids, pregnant women, older sure. folks? Uh, my my population has been pretty consistently 59, 51% women, 49% men. And I have pretty consistently had uh, lots of kids. In fact, um, zero to nine, zero to 10 is by far the larger population that I have. Then, of course, I have their parents. Uh, and then, of course, I have their grandparents. So really, those are the big three humps, if you will. Um, the kids that I don't see are the invincible 20 year olds who don't bother coming to the doctor unless they have a, uh, you know, half their organ hanging out or they have a bone sticking through the body. Uh, but for the most part, um, like I said, my kid population is, is by far the, the, the predominant one and, and then their parents and grandparents. And as, you know, as a osteopathic physician, I see a lot of the sports medicine osteopathic stuff too. Um, but if you look at the numbers, it's predominantly it's, it's, it's family medicine. It's families. That's what it comes down to. Now that we're jumping back and forth, I want to talk about Paraguay and your involvement in the Andrea Ritz Clinic. You've been involved as the, the main doctor um, going down there annually for several years. And yeah. one of the things that I have noticed as a trend amongst my own friends, as well as other physicians that I speak with, is that we as physicians might have had experience in medical school and residency doing service overseas, but you are a DPC doctor who's actively doing overseas medicine regularly and have been for multiple years. How is that working for your practice and how do your patients take that? Well, you know, on the patient side, um, they are extraordinarily and I underscore that several times, extraordinarily supportive of my need to, or my need, desire, inclination, calling, whatever term you want to throw in there, of going to Paraguay. In fact, um, they are just as invested, if you will, remotely as I am when I go there. So they know that, you know, for example, as I mentioned offline, um, this past year was, was not a trip. We didn't have the trip because of COVID. And the patients were very upset about it. <laughs> they were like, well, when are you going? Like, what are your, what are your backup plans? And so they're very invested in my going there, if you will. 
And whether it's just emotional or psychological investment, or I mean, I've had people drop off, they drop off more stuff than I can carry down there, which uh, is, is a great problem to have. Um, there's only so much I can fit into a suitcase. So it's really hard to, in some cases, say, no, I can't take that down because they're being incredibly generous with their time and their financial resources. Yeah, they are 110% on board with my going down there. I am so glad that you shared that because a big hesitancy that I hear from people considering doing DPC out of residency is what are you going to do about vacation or about time off if you are the only doctor there? And you are proof that you can you can do that uh, even with an active practice. And that's wonderful that your patients are actively supporting you doing this. Now, do you have somebody covering your call while you're away? Uh, yes and no. So uh, yes, I do, uh, but no, I don't. So all of my patients are very well aware of when I go to Paraguay or when I'm on vacation, for example, here in Costa Rica. And I tell them that I there is a colleague of mine who I went to residency with who is available if need be. And I kind of give them, I don't want to say kind of tongue-in-cheek advice, but I say to them, if your bone, if a bone is sticking through the body, you don't need to call anybody. You you have my permission to go to the emergency room. Okay. If you have something that's really um, I probably need to have this body part put back together, then by all means go. If it's something where you actually stop and think about whether or not you should go somewhere, then that's probably okay to wait until I get back <laughs> because it's not that acute. But, you know, with with um, the flexibility in direct primary care to offer a lot of asynchronous telehealth, um, so I, I tell folks, listen, you can go see my colleague if you want, but just text me first. You know, it might take me a little longer than it generally does when I'm, when I'm stateside, but please text me first or email me. Because we can probably take care of that without, I don't want to say inconveniencing you, but inconveniencing you from having to, and now granted, the the colleague I have is a a great guy. Uh, I'm not taking that away from him. But there is that intimate relationship that you establish with your patients in a direct primary care practice. So I will say that over the past handful or so of years, the number of folks that have actually had to go see that colleague, less than a handful less than a hand. So even when I'm in Paraguay, which doesn't exactly have the best internet communication services, um, patients know that. And they know I send the message, he'll respond as he's able to, when he's able to. I think the clarity and the education, providing that to the patients is, um, that that solves a lot of the, uh, a lot of the problem of the snafus. And they know, listen, if, you know, if you're worried about you, you dying of constipation, then by all means, <laughs> go to the urgent care clinic or something. But even then, the local urgent care and emergency rooms, I've worked with them long enough that they know that my patients don't just kind of willy-nilly show up because they have the sniffles. That there's been some kind of previous offline communication with them. That's that's pretty awesome confidence that has been built into the community, given that they know that a direct primary care patient has that strong relationship with their doctor who's very invested in their health and they're not just numbers to their doctor. Yeah. In fact, I've even seen some urgent care or ER notes that start out with, this is a patient of Dr. Forbush who's currently on a medical mission in Paraguay. Patient contacted him while he was away and gave him the following advice and told him to follow up here if X, Y, or Z happened. I mean, I've literally seen that in the dictate, which, you know, is really humbling. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's, I don't really know any other word I think it just speaks to the relationship that you're able to have in a direct primary care environment. Now, given that you are in Costa Rica on vacation right now, do you have any guidelines for yourself with regards to balancing checking emails, checking into your clinic and enjoying your vacation? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. So number one, I'm a pretty early riser. (laughs) So to give you an example, I was up at, I don't know, 3.30 or 4 o'clock this morning. Uh, and that's actually um, strangely routine for me. So I will use that time, uh, 45 minutes or, or so, to just kind of check in and see if there's anything I need to address. And then I really, then I don't touch it until noon or one o'clock. So I have, I really try to, unless something really urgent comes up, I really do try to parse that out so that I'm enjoying my life 
and the patient and I'm still there for, and, and, and I, and I forewarn patients. In fact, I just put an automatic reply. I have limited internet connectivity. I'm going to be checking messages between these times. So don't expect a response until then. What communication service are you using with your patients? So I use, uh, I use Spruce messaging service and, um, I also just use uh, HIPAA compliant uh, email. Some, some folks uh, like the text and some folks like the email. I don't really care because they both come to the same inbox and I respond the same way. So it's actually um, very, very seamless work, workflow for me. Uh, and I just set, a, set an automatic responder in both of those, you know, whether it's my email or with Spruce that, you know, I've got limited connectivity. I'll get back to you during these hours. Hang tight. You're not dying. <laughs> so things like that. But both of those have been, uh, I've been a Spruce fan um, since the day they started. And yeah, those cats, those cats have got it going on. The the day that I learned about how you could set those, uh, you, that you could preset those I'm yeah. this type of type of messages, um, it sold me. <laughs> and, yeah. and I, you know, and I'm still in fee for service. So it, it's for those who might not be familiar with Spruce, definitely check them out. So I want to ask if you could share with us about the Andrea Ritz Clinic, because in previous oh. interviews, you've shared about how George and Sylvia created the clinic. But one of the things that I, I actually was looking up before our interview today was, so Andrea was 12 years old when she passed. And she actually yeah. passed in 95, the day after my birthday. So it was wow. pretty funny because I'm also born in 1982. So I, one thing I, that I couldn't glean that I was wondering if you could share was what what was Andrea's what what happened with Andrea that they decided to in her memory create a medical clinic versus something else. Well, you know, George, uh, George and Sylvia are absolutely fantastic people, and I don't want to go into too many of the personal details, but I will share things that I have shared publicly in the past, and 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 also my my sense just knowing the kind of DNA that they're made with is that they really wanted to use this as part of their grieving process. I know that sounds kind of funny, but they had, because they had been in the Peace Corps for so long and both their daughter and their son had been known by the Guarani people that they felt that, and they felt it was just really a part that they could continue to allow her to live through the hearts and minds of not only family here in the States, but also her extended family. And in many in many ways, probably her primary family, when you think about the relationship we have with folks in Paraguay, um, to just to li live on at ad infinitum. And, you know, I've had the humbling pleasure of meeting folks um, and caring for the folks down there that knew Andrea. And she was clearly a very special young lady. Um, and so I think, uh, I, I think it was just part of how they, how they process the, this, the incredible loss and kind of making lemonade out of lemons. I hate to kind of put it that way, but that's probably the best the kind of mainer way to say it, I suppose. Um, just really allowing her to continue to give and to continue to live on in the hearts and minds of people. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a beautiful thing that they are actively helping, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people every year. I mean, even... Right even indirectly, right? Like the people who might come to the clinic and see you or see Cesar or see Dolly, they they have family members too that might be, you know, extended family might be relieved because the, the patient is getting care. So I, I would assume that it's thousands of people that are benefiting. And the fact that Andrea's name is on the clinic, I think that's absolutely beautiful. I, I always think about tributes and where they're coming from I, because I, I lost my dad seven years ago. And so I always think about when people mention my dad, um, that he's not gone completely. So that is wonderful that you are part of this beautiful tribute to Andrea. Yeah. I kind of feel like, I, I mean, I never met her, but I feel like I know her. <laughs> it's kind of a weird, you know, kind of a weird thing. Well, not weird, but you know, weird for some people, let's put it that way. <laughs> when you are getting ready for your trip, down to Paraguay, what does that look like in terms of do you do you coordinate care uh, with the team down in Paraguay before you go um, within weeks, or have you been operating the whole year through so it's a quick turnaround from your clinic down to Paraguay? Yeah, it's, it's, so it's be, it's become a much um, quicker turnaround, if you will, 
uh, historically, um, George has gone down two weeks ahead of me to get some of the some of the more logistical things um, uh, together, um, kind of a plan, if you will, of where we're going and where's our priority and what, what what's our plan B if the weather doesn't cooperate or plan C if we can't get road access. So he does a lot of those, um, a lot of those things ahead of time. And unfortunately, he does uh, he does a fair amount of politicking be- with the with the corrupt government in Paraguay, which probably takes him a week. Um, but, you know, with the advent of um, things such as WhatsApp or even just texting, um, really, I'm able to, we're able to continue a lot of that care uh, even after I'm gone. So Cesar or Dolly, I'm con- he con- he'll send me a picture of an EKG or send me a picture of a rash or send me a picture of, you know, someone's MRI or send me a picture of a lap, you know, all that sort of stuff. That, so it, it does connect us a bit more. and. Therefore, when we're down there, I've got a lot of this preloaded information, if you will, and uh, and I've been going down there long enough. I know I know the families that they're talking about. You know, we're going over to you know, fill in the blank name, and we're going to go see Theo. Oh yes, I remember Theo. His wife is this. The kids got this. Da, 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 da. So it, it it's become um, quite a bit more efficient over the past several years. Um, but we do try to preload it, and just to make our time as efficient as possible, uh, we really do try to. Um, cater to the um, the native Guarani people, which are nearly impossible to reach anyway. Um, and Cesar does a lot of that, um, does a lot of that footwork, if you will, ahead of time. Um, so it's, it, it does make it, it, it's a lot easier to say this year than last year, which was easier than the year before and before that, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that you had mentioned before that I wanted to ask you a little bit more detail about is the idea that you brought osteopathic medicine to the community. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they, the Guarani folks had never had contact um, with an osteopathic physician. So it's important to kind of give you a bit of a backdrop on what a um their, their doctor's appointments are very much no touch. Okay. So, uh, I, it's kind of funny because until the, until the patients got to know me, the first thing the men did when they came in was they took their pants off. The first thing the women did, they, they took their shirts off. And I'm like, what are these people doing? I don't know. Why, why are they stripping naked in front of me? But then you learn that that's, that's kind of a cultural thing. And even the, even having said that, it's a very no touch. Um, physician patient interaction. It's, it's really, uh, you have X, Y, and Z, which means you have this and here's your, here's your fake medication to take. So for them to have the experience of being, um, physically touched by a physician was strange to begin with, let alone adding in the manipulation piece. And, um, I, I really, uh, shot myself in the foot day one of my first year, because I had quite a few cases where I wasn't doing anything special. I was just doing some general first and second year, you know, OMT stuff. And the incredible response that these folks received uh, was beyond, beyond words, beyond description. And uh, having said, I mean, I, I had people, I had one guy throw his crutches through the waiting room and run down the road. And now I have 50 people watching him and then all looking at me. And I'm like, I don't know what to do about this. Or, you know, I had a 13 year old who had had these chronic uh, migraines that caused her to have vision loss in the right ear. And I just did some very simple, you know, myofascial balance ligamentous sort of stuff. And she, so then she and her mother are screaming at the top of their lungs. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, what did I do? I don't know what they're saying. They're speaking in a, in a Guarani tongue that, we're all having a bit of a hard time putting words together. Number one, because it's a different dialect. Number two, because they're talking at 643 miles an hour and they're screaming at the top of their lungs and no, but no one in the room is upset. And we finally able to put together that she's screaming. I can see, I can see, I can see. So now we've got 50 people looking at me wondering what the heck, what the heck did I just do? So, I mean, that's a really uncomfortable, I mean, there's nothing special about me. I just happen to be doing the things that I learned. Um, but I think because that was an element that they had never had, it had such a profound effect. Um, so what they, 
they effectually refer to me as mano santos, which means holy hands. Even it's very, I don't like using that term, but that's the term that they give me um, just because of these multiple experiences. So now, you know, my second year, I had people coming from Brazil. The third year, I had people coming, coming from Argentina and all over the place. So it's not anything that has to do with me. It has to do with the osteopathic approach. That's the important thing to keep in mind is that it has such a profound effect um, to otherwise um, naive patients, meaning they've never had this before. Uh, so I think, I think those are the two big things. You know, they, they're not used to someone actually touching them to examine and then actually doing something with their hands. And if you ever want to hear more, you can call George or Sylvia. They'll tell you more of the story. It's so interesting because when you talk about your experience using osteopathic medicine and how, you know, you, you've been given this nickname, um, I, I think about how patients went from fee-for-service experience to experiencing you as a DPC physician and how, it, you know, it might not be the same, um, the same reaction from your patients, but the idea that you are delivering personalized care that I'm sure is life-changing in, in different ways to your current patients, it, it makes me think about those parallels. Oh, I think there are tons of parallels there. Uh, you know, I think that the, our patients are, are starving figuratively and literally for healthcare. They are being, um, you know, shuffled through a turnstile medical industrial complex where people only acknowledge them by their date of birth or their medical record number. They're, they're not being heard. They are literally being starved. And when they enter a direct, direct primary care practice, uh, it's sort of like you haven't eaten for a month and now you're sitting down at a smorgasbord. Like, where do I start? Now that can be very, that can be very difficult for, for some patients and, and DPC physicians to be like, Oh my gosh, what am I, you know, this person is going to suck me, suck me dry like a Hoover. But there, I think the reality is most of the time they just, they're, they're so hungry <laughs> that they, 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 they initially, um, just want to feed. They just want to feed. And then, at least in my experience, what I have found is that when, once patients realize, no, this is actually the real deal, I don't have to eat all at once because the smorgasbord is still going to be here. So they learn that over a couple of visits. Once they really understand that what I am purporting or proposing as a, as a medical practice is actually valid. I, I've noticed that with not so much now because the word's gotten around. I've been doing this for I don't know, seven years or whatever. But certainly when I first started doing the direct primary care model, um, you know, pa patients would come in like almost like a dare, like they're daring me to fulfill what I'm saying that I'm going to do. And then once you do that, you kind of burst their bubble, like, well, crap, I guess what is really, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess this really is what it is. Uh, okay. I guess I don't need to come in every 15 minutes and, you know, or something like that. So <laughs> it's important for, um, for new DPCers, uh, to hear that that is a phenomenon. And if you ever want to vent with me, uh, more than happy to chat with you, <laughs> more than happy to chat with you. Uh, but it is a phenomenon that kind of regulates itself more more times than not. I'm glad that now you're seven plus years into practice that your patients, you know, are, are not are not in that disbelief mode, so that you can also have a, a nice vacation too. No, that's entirely correct. So they 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 in fact, um, let's see, um, uh, I, th I think I dealt with maybe three messages today. All of them started out by saying, I'm really sorry for disturbing your vacation, but I have a quick question about my mom had cellulitis, about my kid who had ear pain that's teething, all that sort of stuff. And all of them ended with, enjoy your very well-deserved vacation. Now, I want to ask about your transition because you've spoken previously about how, how other physicians who were in fee-for-service were completely in disbelief that you were going to transition to DPC. You've talked about how the patients express their, you know, hesitancy or fear in, in joining the, the model. But what about your transition going from fee to service to DPC? How was your growth initially and what helped you to get momentum to, to be where you are now where the patients are, are joining because they, they the word has gotten out? So I'll take you back to 2013, okay, or in 2012. So but I, I had a, an insurance employed practice. That's the way I like to refer to it because I worked for the insurance companies. I didn't work for patients. 
And uh, the I'm going to say at least the year, if not the two years prior to me converting, I, um, well, to be frank, really grew to hate myself. Um, I, particularly the year before I transitioned, I frankly became a very angry, bitter, is this, is this podcast edited for um, less than publicly consumable terms? A very angry SOB. I had a lot of um, physical somatic symptoms like IBS and reflux. I wasn't sleeping. I was drinking three pots of coffee a day. I was just angry and mean. And I did not like who I had become in the mirror. And my wife would would certainly validate that as would my kids and as would my staff at the time, just a miserable SOB. And really, I remember looking at myself in the mirror one day and I can't, I, I said, I cannot believe the monster I have become and I cannot do this anymore. So um, I did what every smart man does, which is not tell his wife. And, <laughs> and I wrote all of my letters um, of withdrawal to the insurance companies, mailed them, uh, waited a couple of days, and then, and then told Kristen, my wife, and made sure that I did that from at least three hours away so she couldn't kill me. <laughs> I'm joking about that. But no, really, it's just was, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I had about 27 or 2,800 patients at the time. And there was no template, no framework for this thing that we now call direct primary care. I had had a colleague, uh, Mike Champy in South Portland, that had gone uh, insurance-free but not membership-based at the time. And so I was chatting a lot with him, and he was prompting me to stop being a mean you-know-what. And I kept telling him to go screw and all, you know, all that sort of stuff. And basically, Mike and I, we, we had heard like through the grapevine of some other people trying to do something different without insurance, but really there was no, there was no template. And so literally I shot from the hip and said, I'm putting this together. I don't know if it's going to fly, but I can't keep doing what I'm doing. So even if it fails, I'm no further behind. And you know, I can work at Walmart handing out smiley stickers or, you know, hand out Z packs at the local urgent care ER if need be. Um, so that's really what, that was the breaking point for me. And um, so I made that decision in December 2013 and went from 27 or 2,800 patients on New Year's Eve to about less, less than 100 on New Year's Day. What was the reason that those patients stayed? All of the patients that stayed, or I should say most of the patients that stayed, uh, were folks that I had taken care of um, from residency and that had followed me to the first private practice that I worked at. They'd followed me back when I took a job for the... Uh, the, the industrial complex in town, and then they followed me to my new practice. So, you know, that's that's a pretty humbling thing to have. And I remember one in particular, a, reti a retired teacher who said, I've stuck with you this long, might as well keep going. <laughs> so uh, the folks I've been taking care of a long time, and I was, you know, there was quite a bit of kickback. And I found that one of the things, one of the responses that I gave to patients that I think struck home a lot is I said, I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. And I would love to have you stay, but I understand if you need to go somewhere else, but I want you to know I'm not moving. So yeah, so that's kind of my transition. And the only regret I have is I didn't do it sooner. It's really powerful yep. to hear that though, because, you know, with you being and maintaining your, your full scope, care as an osteopathic physician and having lived the fee for service life and having made that transition, you know, it's, we, we hear the numbers, you know, 5%, 10% or less will of uh, patients might join you in your new venture. If you, if you are transitioning and, you know, that's an even bigger unknown for people who have not yet opened their own clinic ever before. And they're still in residency, but it's so powerful to hear that. And I hope that resonates with, with folks because I'm hard pressed to talk to anyone who doesn't share that similar regret of not doing it sooner. Yeah. I, and I can't, I can't overemphasize. So that is, that is my one regret that I did not do it sooner. Um, I think it would have saved, um, would have saved me a lot of internal pain. It would have saved my loved ones a lot of 
um, having to put up with me, <laughs> if you can, I can say that. But I'll also tell the listeners that, it, listen, I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. And if I can figure this out, you guys can figure this out. <laughs> it's it's really, um, and I don't mean to be too, too, too self-deprecating, but really it is, you made it through medical school, you made it through internship, you made it through residency. This is such an easy thing to do compared to what you have done. I don't care if you're if you're you know, single, married, kids, no kids, male, female, 40, 20, 50, I, it doesn't matter. I mean, this stuff is, um, like I said, if I can figure this out, and I'm more than happy to tell you what not to do because I made plenty of mistakes along the way. Um, but if I can figure this out, anybody can figure it out. Now, you are still practicing obstetrics and um, you yep. are still also doing inpatient medicine. Can you share with us a little bit about how you balance all of that in your practice? Sure. So um, I I still do inpatient care and I still do obstetrics. Um, I don't do nursing home anymore. Um, That volume just got to the point where it was, I mean, if I have one of my patients that is is admitted to say a skilled facility, I'll follow them. Like if they're, they had their hip replaced or something like that. But I have to say my nursing home population has kind of weeded itself out. Uh, I don't need to be too, well, you understand what I mean. Um, so a lot of this comes back to, um, really patient education. So number one, patients know that I'm going to see them when I, when they're in the hospital. And that's number one. Number two, they're not allowed to have a doctor do anything unless that doctor has spoken to me. And even if they haven't spoken to me, the patient says, no, I need to talk to Dr. Forbes first, because I tell them sometimes hospital physicians kill people and it's not necessarily intentionally, but they don't have the working intimate relationship of the nuances of your care that I have. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they don't know what they're doing. I'm just saying they don't have a broader sense of the system that you live in. So not to call them into question, but simply to provide them uh, a different perspective on how the care needs to be delivered. And I will tell you that most of, and I'll use surgeons as an example, because that's probably the more common thing. Um, the surgeons, the surgeons that I work with are very acutely aware of that, um, that um, they're allowed to cut, but not much else. <laughs> I hate to say that, but really a lot of it does come back down to the patients. And so I've had patients call me from the floor and say, uh, I'm assuming that the ER didn't let you know that I was admitted last night. So I'm calling you from room 524, letting you know that I was admitted for X, Y, and Z. And, and I say, okay, fine. I'll be by during lunch or at the end of the day. And it seems like it's a lot to manage, but it's actually, when you've got that kind of relationship with patients, it's actually pretty easy. Um, there is a residency program at the tertiary care center that will do a lot of the stupid computer work for me, which as much of a techie as I am, they have a sucky computer system. I'm just going to admit that. Um, so they'll do a lot of that kind of you know minute stuff for me. But it's actually it's actually relatively relatively straightforward. I think the other thing too is that my hospitalization volume has gone down because I'm able to see people when they're sick. So there's a lot of uh, preemptive care to prevent hospitalizations that we do on a daily. And we have people, we have our CHFers that know if you gained more than three pounds and you're getting sure, don't even bother calling for an appointment. Just show up at the office. Just show up and we'll get take care of you. Uh, as far as the OB side, I do use a residency uh, program from uh, time to time, but it, it really comes down to having a good relationship with patients. So I, uh, so I got kind of reminded of a story from last year when I was in Costa Rica. Uh, the young lady who I've delivered her, uh, actually I delivered all four, of her, all, well now now four, but at the time only three, uh, delivered all four of her kids, and she was uh, she was due about a day or two before I was going to return. And I said, listen, we got one of two things. You either deliver before I leave or you keep that baby in until I get back. I get back into town. She calls me and says, are you back in town? Yes. Okay, we can have the baby now. We had the baby that night. So, I mean, that's just, and that's just a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird example, but it really does speak to um, the relationship. You don't make. You're not allowed to have this baby until I'm back in town. Well, what am I supposed to do? I can tell you what you're not supposed to do. Okay, so don't do any of that stuff that makes the baby come sooner. Okay. <laughs> you know, just having a three month old myself, I if I was that mom, I would have been the happiest mom ever. 
<laughs> and I and I and I've had other I've had other women who said, "Okay, you're leaving it. Okay, we're going to have the baby before you leave." And they, they've called and said, "Okay, we're having the baby today." Even even first time moms, believe it or not. Well, especially that they know that you're going to be there for them after the delivery, right? I mean, that's that's one thing that most moms don't get when they go to the floor and they deliver in a hospital and they a totally separate team of doctors is, is rounding on their kid than rounding on them. And so I, I, I it doesn't surprise me that first time moms have that reaction too, but I'm glad they do. Oh, you know, so I, one of the one of the marketing phrases that I've used was, um, I know who would deliver your baby, but do you, you know, because they get shuffled around to whoever, whoever the laborist is or whoever the OBG went like, you know, if I, if I do your OB care, I know who will deliver the baby. I, I have missed one delivery in 20 years, which is, uh, yeah, that's, that's incredible. And so, you know, moms kind of joke about that. Oh, I know who's delivering my baby, but do you know who's going to deliver yours? It's kind of like a, a, jo a joke now among the moms. Um, but you know, we have a birthing center in town that's really grown up. And so a lot of women are going there. So like everyone else, my volume has gone down because the birthing center volume has gone up. But even then, I have someone do, I guess, maybe a couple of days before I get back. And she's a nurse. And she's like, Who's, what's, what are we going to do about my kid? What, you, have a, you have a smartphone. So pop, prop that, turn that sucker on. Give me a video. We'll go over a few things. And But, you know, it's that kind of relationship that you develop that is really allows you to have a to have that kind of um, interaction with folks. Yeah. No. Given the investment that you've put into your practice and the relationship you have with your patients, had you ever considered adding another doctor to your practice? Oh my Lord. Yes, 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 and yes. Uh, I have been, for all intents and purposes, begging to get someone to come. I could easily take two other physicians in my practice easily without even blinking. So um, I still have some residual time of service patients. When I, when I first opened a membership, I offered folks the ability to pay as you go and submit to their insurance. So I still have that kind of, I have that, that group of folks that, and, and that's fine. I don't mind, but the past several years, it's been membership only. So I've got about, um, about 1200 patients total. And um, we've had a hundred plus family waiting list since last March. So, and, we, and having said that, we have been rolling people in. So we add someone this morning while I was having Costa Rican coffee, which by the way is incredibly good. Uh, I, we get three new inquiries today. My husband and I want to get on, put on the waiting list. I have a family of five. And we just moved to. The, so if anybody wants to move to Maine, which has wonderful winters, by the way, I should, I should mention that. And a very brief summer, um, but a beautiful autumn slash fall. <laughs> I I, no, I could easily take two two other two other physicians easily. Yeah, you have medical students rotating with you every uh, month. Every month, and what what is it like for a medical student? What what type of experiences does a medical student get when they're with you? And have you gotten any interest from them about DPC? So yes, I've gotten interest from them about DPC, and I'll probably have them see them come back in a handful of years when they're done their residency. Uh, so the the one rule, and I and I give I, I I send a little word document if I will that's got some some tongue in cheek things like they have to watch the Star Wars trilogy if they haven't watched it before. They have to watch Blade Runner. They have to read Atlas Shrugged. They have to read Fahrenheit 451. They have to watch Evil Dead 3, Army of Darkness. They have to watch like all these kind of really fun and including House of God. If they haven't read House of God by the time they come to me, they have to read it during their rotation. And I will buy them the book so that they read it. But all that kind of funny stuff aside, I'm very clear with the, with the, with the medical students that when you come here, you're going to be a doctor. Like that's the way you need to act. You know, yes, you are at a learning stage. Yes, you have things that you need to get under your belt, but you're going to be a doctor. And the more that you picture yourself as a doctor, the easier it's going to be moving forward. And my patients love, love the medical students. Absolutely love the medical students. In fact, I have Many patients who love medical students so they can tell all funny stories about me. But having said that, they are they are very keen on partnering to help their education. So, but I do, I say the okay, Susie, 
uh, student, student physician Doe. You're going in to see Mrs. Brown and you're the doctor. So you don't really get to use the student card, if you will. Well, I didn't really, well, I didn't do this. or I did, Well, then you need to go back in and do it because you, you need to start that critical thinking about not just critical thinking about the diagnosis, but what's the critical thinking about what I should examine or the questions that I should ask or the questions that I didn't think I needed to ask, but I really do need to ask that are incredibly important. Um, so I really emphasize that um, with, the, with, the, with the students, even more so with the interns and residents, because they are doctors. So like, well, what's your, what's your plan? And it's also an opportunity for them, uh, the, particularly the medical students, to see the evil side of, of, uh, of healthcare. Um, we do in-house dispensing in our, uh, in the, in the office and, um, the wholesale prices on uh, medications and, um, and lab testing, uh, they, they don't believe they, they, they don't believe it until I show them an invoice and they almost universally say, well, how come you have to spend this much at fill in the blank pharmacy? I don't know. You have to ask the pharmacist. <laughs> I can't answer that for you. I can't answer why they're charging 10 cents a pill for lisinopril when it costs one. I don't know the answer to that. What a gift of an experience, though, to be able to, as a medical student, learn those lessons. Um, I think the idea that going into a clinic and acting like a doctor, even when you're in medical school, that is so important to developing, like you're saying, you know, that that state of mind where you're you're not relying on your your medical student card. You know, I when right. when right. And I worked in superior nebraska as third year family medicine rotation medical students um i remember my first day in superior yeah 6 30 is our first case you take the scope because we're doing a colonoscopy on a 54 year old this morning and i was like oh i guess that's how it is in superior nebraska and and oh totally because of those types of experiences and because of the the expectation that was made very clear to my husband and I very early on, I think that's what allowed us to feel confident to practice in a rural environment. That's a great example. I was just thinking, I had, oh my gosh, this poor medical, this poor medical student has become a toenail removologist four in a row. But I'm like, it's an ingrown toenail. What are you going to do about it? Well, put him on some antibiotics. Why? we we'll just take the toenail off. Oh, wait a minute. Oh my, what do you, what do you mean? Take the Yes, take the toenail off. Here's the page in Fenninger's, you know, clinical procedures guide. Review that, and then we'll take the toenail off. And I think that, you know, that's I, my observation is that that's that's really missing in medical school education. Like they're not allowed in many cases to do anything. Like they can't even pass gas, you know, without getting a proctor's permission. And so that the the which then only creates a problem for family medicine, full scope family medicine, if you will. Because they don't know, they've never been taught how to do it. So one of my dear, dear friends, Dr. Vance Lassie, uh, is he gave he gave, he and Nick Thompson, Dr. Thompson, gave a lecture on the full spectrum family medicine, which they they did. So those who haven't watched it should watch it because they do a great job about all this uh, all this funky uh, full spectrum stuff, whether it's my minor surgical or just other stuff. They do a great job with that. Definitely. Now I want to ask a COVID question because recently. On social media, you made a video where you were filming the... Was it the car wash? Yeah, the, 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 the car wash was the good part of the of the film because the bad part, <laughs> the poor old folks who were standing right. in line in freezing temperatures, I'm assuming, yeah. waiting yeah. for COVID. And was it a COVID test or a COVID vaccination? It's vaccination. Vaccination. So... To give you a little bit of a backdrop, this is the tertiary. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I do have a bit of common sense. So you have a tertiary care center that has a covered parking garage. They have these poor folks, now, and it's on the Penobscot River. So it's not like we're in a sauna, okay? And it was 20 degrees outside with the wind blowing off the Penobscot River across this open parking lot. And they've got I estimated it a hundred people because that's just like, it looks like about a hundred people standing outside in 20 degree weather with the wind blowing off the river, waiting to get their COVID shot. And my first thought was, why the hell didn't they put them in the covered parking garage? I mean, at the very least. So then I got, as I'm driving back to the office, these things are going through my head and I happen to see the abandoned car wash. I'm like, there's a great idea. Like 
why couldn't they have used the abandoned car wash? Or why couldn't they just have had people pull up with their car, roll their window down and stick their arm out? Like just real practice. So I was a little, I was a little fuming <laughs> that day because it just, just didn't make any sense to me. And I was so, I was so aggravated on several levels. Now, aggravated number one, that we've had this vaccine distribution problem, uh, which I could go into detail about the way the Maine has not handled it really well, but that's a whole separate story. Um, but just the, the lack of, the lack of common sense that, that we're trying to prevent disease and we're asking these 75 year old people to stand outside. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It was just beyond, in my mind, beyond stupidity. Since the rollout of the vaccine in Maine, and you know, it, for those doctors who might be listening who are active on social media or who are just aware of DBC news in general, people like Dr. Lisa Lucas had had been in had been interviewed right. in the in the newspapers about the joke that was the rollout in Maine, especially for doctors like yourself who were no longer associated with a, an insurance driven corporation. So with vaccinations in the future, are you and other doctors in Maine who are independent doctors planning on doing vaccination for, for patients or other, other independent doctors and other independent practitioners? Yeah, so we as the, the, the main arm, if you will, of the New England Direct Primary Care Alliance has made it very clear that we are more than willing to, for example, purchase the freezer necessary to store these. Um, we've, and uh, I'm pretty sure Dr. Lucas mentioned that. And if she didn't mention there, because she mentioned it somewhere else, we are more than willing to do that. There are three main obstacles. Number one, our major healthcare systems, all of which have been dinged for inappropriately diverting COVID vaccines to their non-clinical staff. Problem number one. Problem number two is the state has said we are not going to uh, provide immunizations for any practice that has less than 500 eligible patients. That's problem number two. Problem number three, we have um, our governor's sister who was uh, had been at the, at the osteopathic college and she's not a DO, she's an MD doing some kind of public health thing, was recently interviewed and, uh, and mentioned that uh, private practice is not capable of preparing and administrating multi-dose vial vaccines nor are they capable of answering patients' questions. So, you know, that sends a very clear message on how our, I'm not going to label anybody, but how our governmental institutions view, um, view primary care. Nurse. And having said that, we're, <laughs> we're going we're to continue fighting, whether it's the COVID or influenza or, you know, MMR. It is unfortunately one of those things that um, I guess we need to find the right person to talk to or something like that. Going to pay, some, I hate to say pay somebody off, but um, we're more than willing to do our part. Um, but in order for us to do our part, we have to have someone willing to let us do our part. If that makes any kind of weird sense. And early on, uh, I think it was the first week or the second week of, of the vaccine rollout. I did a little quick math and and estimated that with pretty close accuracy that our 15 DPC practices in the state of Maine would have matched the vaccination rollout for the entire state at 3.6%. I said, you know, if they just had given us some, we could have made that, you know, 7.2%, but you know, neither here nor there. So I know, and I know that Dr. Lucas is working hard at pulling strings where she could pull them as are, are the rest of us. She's really taking the lead for our, for our regional group. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's a fiasco would be an understatement. And sadly, she had mentioned that it was only because she had made it public and spoken to somebody right. in the media that she even got a vaccine herself. And, you know, right. that the DPC doctors in Pittsburgh have created their own company um, where they have purchased a, a, a vaccine that can, uh, excuse me, they have purchased a freezer that can hold the vaccines. Um and maintain the, the proper temperature, but now even the state of Pennsylvania is pulling the, the the vaccines out from underneath them. And so, I I wonder if you know when you when you talk about paying someone off, not necessarily in a literal way, but but putting that that plug out continuously in the public media um, to 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 give them you know 
to give them fuel for the the fire of we need to protect everybody. And that includes independent physicians who are working hard to keep patients out of the emergency rooms. So, yeah, I'm on staff at both the hospitals in the neighboring town and um, was told on multiple occasions that I was not eligible for the, for the COVID vaccine because I was not an employed physician um, multiple, multiple times. Uh, and I made enough of a stink, not going to say for me, but there are other independent positions in the area that that they're ignoring as well. And, and finally, uh, I, I was offered it and I just kind of had this ethical, um, I don't want to say dilemma, ethical crossroads in my mind. I said, I, you know what, I'm, I actually can't take this because there is so much theft and corruption um, with diverting vaccine to the people that need it, that I, I personally, I don't think anybody else should have to take this position. I personally, I, I can't, I can't do that. So um, I looked at both of my local hospitals who are diverting vaccines to non-clinical uh, staff. When you can give me assurance that everyone in our community over the age of, at the time it was 70, has received this vaccination, I'll step in line. But I'm also going to tell you, if I see any of my colleagues, any of those rat you-know-whats in line, and I, and I see that there's an elderly gentleman or elderly woman that hasn't gotten it, I'm going to make a big public stink about it. Because sure, you're a doctor, sure, you're a nurse, or sure, you're whatever, and sure, you you are a frontline healthcare worker, whatever term we're supposed to, whatever baloney term we're supposed to be using now. But you're 35 years old or 40 years old, and you have no health care problems versus the 75-year-old fellow who's got, you know, the trifecta of health conditions. That's just, but that's just, that's a decision I, that, that I, I came to for myself, and I would never expect anyone else to take that other than me. So, a little rant. Sorry. <laughs> Well, no, I, I sadly, in in but not surprisingly, that is a problem all over the the state. Yeah, when the when the business staff that ever interact with patients got the vaccine long before our residents did, that wasn't cool at all. Or our ICU nurses, or fill in the blank, that just wasn't cool. So, so I hope you guys do, and I hope that everybody who is wanting to house and distribute the vaccine. I hope we we get more um, more independent doctors being able to do that as we go into the future. Yeah, and geographically, Dr. Lucas's place is actually pretty ideal for the for the geographic layout of our practices in Maine. I'm the furthest north, but she's a little south, a little more south than halfway, but still a very very favorable location to do it. And so, and she's a she's a firebrand, so she'll make it happen. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Now, I want to shift to. To your role as, as the tech guru in DPC, because whether you oh. like it or not, um, you, you definitely are the, the person, when people hear VoIP, they think Dr. Forbush, when people hear, <laughs> so I want to ask you first, um, what EMR are you using and why? Uh, I'm going to tell you that I am uh, in the process of changing over 100% to acute health, and I'm going to, le- I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, it would not be um, fair for me to say who I'm leaving and why I'm leaving, but I'm more than happy to answer that on a personal level with anybody who messages me. Um, I so I'm moving to acute health. It was delayed a bit because we had some medical issues and with my staff um, who had some health problems that that delayed it a bit. Um, but we plan on going completely on with acute health pretty much by the time I get back from vacation. And for those who have seen acute perhaps at like the hint summit via the virtual table or who have seen the YouTube videos. Can you tell us why you're, you're going with acute and what to expect with acute in the near future? Sure. I think, uh, I think Sherwood Agarwal, the, Sherwood, the, the, the creator of acute, um, I think um, approached developing an EMR from a very different and beneficial angle. And that is um, from the patient's perspective. And I think that allows him to have a different um, lens by which to look through the EMR um, that makes it much more amenable to, um, particularly to direct primary care physicians. So I, I, that's number one. I just kind of, I think the, the overarching um, philosophy. Uh, number two, I, I'm pretty sure he runs on just as much caffeine as I do uh, because, because he is constantly rolling out um, new feature additions, little nuances and things like that. Uh, things of that nature. So I don't think there's a week or two that goes by that something new hasn't been added. 
Um, so I like that, that developmental fortitude, if you will. And, and he clearly, he clearly has that. Uh, and along with that, he just frankly listens, you know, he, he, he listens to, you know, I'll send him an email that's got like five or six items and the, and the, and the, the subject will be here. I go again. Okay. <laughs> with another, but you know, he just really listens to what I have to say and, not that I have the greatest ideas in the world all the time, but at least it's, it's, yeah, you might want to think about doing it X, Y, and Z. And here's why. Because when I go here and I go here and I go here, my natural inclination is to then go there. So if it's just a matter of I need to be retrained, that's fine. But I wanted to give you that perspective of way I and maybe at least a few other people are, are looking at it. And he has a very, um, how shall I say, a very vibrant plan for where this is going. It would not be prudent of me to reveal any of those things other than to say he has a very vibrant plan for what this product will become. Let's put it that way. I think that it aligns perfectly with DPC just because the mindset of a DPC doctor is always to bring value to your patients and to yourself and to your practice. And by creating something that is constantly evolving for the better. I think that that idea is, is really in alignment with the, the ideals of DPC. Yes. Yes. Um, with acute as it exists today, what are the top three things of acute that blow you away when someone is using the EMR who might not be familiar with it? Uh, number one, ease of use. Uh, number one, um, this, the, for want of a better way of putting it, the speed of the EMR, even though it's all web-based, uh, I think he's got some, I think he has some caching built in that just makes it much more responsive. Let's put it that way. Um, the usability across various platforms, whether it's an iPad, a computer, or an iPhone, is a very mobile friendly. Um, I think those are, those are the things that immediately come to mind. Uh, ease of use is, you know, par is, is paramount. It doesn't take much more than a couple of clicks to get what you want accomplished. Um, which is, is nice to me because I have a three click rule. I don't like clicking more than three times. If you get to click more than three times, you're doing something wrong. So, and that would, that would be the, that would be the, the things that I would add to it. Uh, and I guess the other part would be just his, um, it's almost like, um, like what's new this week in acute, you know, it's like, Oh, what's new this week in acute. Oh, look at that. Wow. That's going to be really handy. Like you just added out, uh, he just enhanced the, um, the, the to do messaging, um, service. Uh, in, inter inter EMR service, I'm like oh wow, that's gonna be really slick. I hadn't thought about that, but that's gonna be really handy. Yeah. When you use tech to your advantage in your practice, I want to ask about how you leverage tech without losing that personalized feel to your medicine and to the way you practice. Because um, very big in the marketing world are things like messaging bots and pre-made videos that might be made in hopes of targeting a, a bigger audience. On, on your site, you have a great example of how you're still using your website for what you need it to do. But uh, one of the features is when a person is contacting you, you have a drop-down menu that offers them options like, uh, the question is, what can we do for you? And your drop-down menu specifies options like, I have a general question. I need to update my contact information. I need a medication refill. How do you view tech as something that can help a DPC be the best? Sure. So tech should serve the purpose of making your life easier. That's the overarching rule. It should not replace you. Um, there are some things that can be automated, and I'll share an example in just a moment. But it should be something that makes it easier for you or your staff or whomever to do the things that you want them to do. So going back to that contact form for a moment, if they were to select, I need a prescription refill, that goes through a filter on our email service that automatically prioritizes that prescription refill that goes directly to my office nurse who then fills it in a matter of minutes to an hour. Uh, and and I, I can do that as well. So if she happens to be out of the office and that I just use go into that email um, email address. Or if someone clicks the link that I want to learn, I, I want to be added to our list, that automatically creates a, a line item in a Google Excel, Google Sheets spreadsheet that puts their, all that contact information that they put in automatically adds them to the next line, which then gets, is in, for all intents and purposes, highlighted, if you will. So we come in in the morning, we can see, oh, we've got, you know, two or three new people that are added. We need to just touch base with them. 
So all we really need to do is to have a is to have a touch point human voice with them. The rest of that information has already been collected, which is really what technology is supposed to do. You know, it should collect that information and parse it down in a way that is most meaningful to you, for you to do the human interaction part. So uh, whether whether it's those two things or there are some workflows that we have outside of outside of Spruce or email where calls automatically get routed to me and almost unanimously people are caught off guard. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you talked to me, that you're going to get me. Well, you made this selection, which meant that you needed to talk to me. So you're talking to me. How can I help you today? <laughs> so the, and so the, the big overarching thing, and I'm not, a, I, I think, I think things like bot apps are very helpful for parsing some of that information down. Like for example, the Facebook bot, or uh, I had a website bot on my site for a while and I took it down because I want to revamp it and make it more user friendly, if you will, less body and more human-y, if that makes any sense. But that will help to divert messages and divert questions to the most appropriate resource, which may be me or maybe Betty or Kim, my, my office staff. With regard to the pre-made videos, I think they're, they're really handy um, as a resource. And a really simple way of, of personalizing that is to do a personal intro. Now, I know that doing videos and things like that can be, can be very daunting for some folks. Let me give you, a, let me tell the listeners a little secret. Patients don't care. They don't care. They don't care if you're me uh, doing a video on a 20 degree cold day by an abandoned car wash. <laughs> okay. They, 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 they don't need a big cinema cinematic uh, production. What they want is you. And whether it's your smartphone, your Android, your, your, your iPhone or whatever, you don't need a big kind of fancy setup. Just giving that three to five minute, even less uh, intro to say a pre-made video goes a long way, goes much farther than just posting the pre-made video. I'm, I've never been a big, I've always wanted to be, I've, I've always wanted to be Doug Farrego who could seemingly write forever and I'm say a lot and sometimes never say a single thing, but that's because I've known Doug for 20 something years and I can say that, <laughs> but um, I've never been a big writer or a big blogger. But I will tell you that even when, even the times that I've sat down and written four or five sentences about X, Y, or Z, it's really meaningful. That personal connection is really meaningful. So all that pre-made stuff, all that bot stuff, all of that stuff is all fine and dandy as long as you personalize it. Even if it's 30 second intro, hey, I just saw this pre-made video. I thought you folks would, would, would really enjoy it. Let me know your thoughts, end of the video. And that can be done on your, like I said, your phone or your computer. And as long as you've got a, as long as you've got reasonable resolution and reasonable audio, it's gonna be a hit, which is really nice because when you think about our, our competition in the medical industrial complex, our competition sucks. So we just need to suck less. <laughs> I can't agree with you more on that. I mean, there's some great examples out there. Um, Dr. John Sanders, Dr. Lauren Hughes. Uh, and recently I saw a, a, a new doctor who's going to be opening up a clinic uh, here shortly, Dr. Basil. I don't, I don't recall where she's going to be located, but um, there's different examples of how people are harnessing video and personalized video to introduce themselves and to tell their why to their patients right out right out of the gate. And I think that especially now when we're facing a lot of telemedicine, inpatient visits have their doctors masked. Um, it really adds that that personalized touch that you really can't get like we could before. And right. when you're in a fee for service clinic. I think one of the saddest things that I heard when in the first two, three years when I was onboarding patients was no doctor has ever spent this much time with me. And when, when you, when you mentioned earlier about how people are so starved for, for, you know, food and they're at the buffet and there's no lack of food, you know, that parallel to DPC the the idea of harnessing your personality in a video and it can be watched at two o'clock in the morning when someone is, you know, sitting at home with a, a kid who might have a rash and they're like, what am I going to do? I'm going to contact this doctor right now because I just saw them and their video convinces me that I need, I need this person because they, they, they look and they sound like they care because they explain to me why they care and why they're doing this model. I, I agree completely. In fact, I had, I'm reminded when you said rash, uh, enroll your medical students. 
I had a medical student who made me five videos about fever, rash, diarrhea, and I forgot what the other two are. Now, this is a guy that had spent quite a bit of time in the office, so the patients knew him. But just it's literally the simple things that that have such a profound impact. Now, I want to digress slightly because when you mentioned that you will be going to acute, is the is the process of transferring records into acute and all of your information is acute making that process easy or is it is are there some hurdles to jump over just because it's a different emr no so most emrs will export the patient's chart as a ccda or con continuing continuity data something 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 i forgot what the whole acronym stands for So you can export that as that particular file and literally import it into acute so things like the uh, problem list, the allergies, uh, all that, uh, all that jazz, uh, demographic information, etc. It's um, uh, would be a two click. So you click to export, click to import. So I guess that's a two click. <laughs> and I know that, and I know that Shrewd is making uh, is um, is working on that. Uh, so that's really one click, um, just a an, just an API integration from fill in the blank EMR to another one. Um, so really behind the scenes, but at the moment it's export import. So relatively, relatively straightforward. I'm glad that you mentioned that because there, there can be some anxiety behind. Oh, totally. Into yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think, uh, so let's see, this will be my seventh EMR or eighth EMR <laughs> or something like that over time. I'm um, pretty part of the problem is that I, I end up doing a lot of beta testing um, for or alpha testing something sometimes for a lot of things. So which kind of sh I shoot myself in the foot sometimes, but it is and will continue to be a fairly streamlined, uh, fairly streamlined process. Given that you are the beacon of hope for using tech to to make things easier in our lives. Um, <laughs> what what other tech or tools do you use and love? Okay, so I already mentioned I already mentioned Spruce, which I have a, a, a love a love fest with. Um, so, I think having a solid um, customer relations manager application, a CRM, outside of your or as part and parcel with the unit, because some EMRs offer it and some just have kind of a basic functionality, is really key. So that you can you can have things that matter to your relationship but don't matter to the patient relationship, if you will. And I don't just mean birthdays, but I mean, uh, you know, relationships among patients, for example, or uh, some uh, some kind of, I don't want to say business contact, but I mean, you put this stuff in the social history as well. But if you put it into like a CMR where you can actually extract that data, it makes it a lot easier moving forward because you can partner with patients about different things. So that's uh, number two. Uh, some kind, some very solid email offering. Most people use uh, Microsoft 365 or or Gmail. Uh, I am in the midst of um, de-Googleizing my office. So I am going to be moving on to a combination of Proton and Fastmail for those of you folks that don't don't want to be Googleized, <laughs> if you will. And then, but you know, perhaps the biggest overarching thing is, as I mentioned earlier, you want to use the tech that's going to make your life easy. It's going to make your life easier. So uh, most folks would not find my workflow very easy. For example, I virtualize my Windows environment on a Dell R720 using Procmox. Uh, I do that so I can access my Windows environment regardless of where I am. Uh, if people's heads are spinning, great. If those that understand what I'm talking about, I'll buy you a beer. That'd be that'd be great. But that's the stuff that that works for, because I have so many other fingers, you know, other hands in different pots. That's what works for me. So if work, if using an iPad is what works for you, if using a laptop or using a desktop or using whatever works for you, then that's what you ought to go with, not what someone's telling you to do. If you're a Mac person, stay with Mac. If you're a Windows person, stay with Windows. If you're, if you're, uh, I don't think I've ever run across anyone in DPC that's a big Linux fan yet. But if you're a Linux fan, then we can talk about distributions. That's fine. Is it Debian or is it? Is, we can we can do all those sort of things too. But um, it really needs to be what's going to work for you and also what's going to work for patients, which is why I mentioned earlier, some folks, some patients will text me and some folks will email me. I don't force them to do something that they are not going to do. 
But what I do on my end is make it easy so that regardless of how they chose to send a message to me, it still comes through to the same unified spot for me so that I can respond back to them in a way that best suits them. And the same thing applies to um, to our voicemail system. So there are still some people that want to call and leave a message. That's not a problem at all. We have all of our voicemails that are transcribed to MP3, put on a dashboard and email to us. So that just makes it, it, it meets the patient where they're at and it makes it easy for us on our end. Because you've been practicing in your DPC clinic for over seven years and you've developed a workflow that works for you, I want to ask about innovation in using tech towards those goals of building an environment that works easier for you and it is seamless for the patients. When you are doing your everyday you know, duties, how do you reevaluate your practice to see if there's some innovation needed or um, if if you'd like to improve, you know, one aspect of your of your DPC by utilizing tech. Sure. So I, I I go back to my rule of threes. If I've done something that seems laborious more than three times, it needs to change. So I need to do something different, and it could be as simple as creating a new snippet in Text Expander, creating a new template for an office note, um, or I mean, it could be it could be that simple, or it could be something as uh, something like our work for drawing, preparing, and labeling labs. If, if this is taking me, if I have, if this is taking more than a couple of steps, and I really need to streamline this in a way, not just for me, but for my staff. So you have to I have two staff. You have to bring them into that workflow as well, because what may work for me doesn't work for them, and more times than not, it really needs to work for them and not for me so much. But uh, if I find that I am if I've done something repetitively, I use three times just as my rule in my mind, then I automate that in some way, shape, or form. Like I have done this three times in a row. Okay, new text expander snippet. Boom, done that. Or new uh, email template. Or uh, new this or new that. And so constantly evolving and, and because things change too. So you may get a different silly lab form that you now, okay, now I got to change the way that I do this. Or a new piece of tech comes along. Okay, now I got to do it this way instead because the old way I did it doesn't, doesn't really jive or work that well. But it really does come down to a periodic self-reflection, like how am I spending more energy than I feel like I should be on this particular task? Um, so that's kind of how I philosophically go at it. And then from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, that, so I'll go back to my Proxmox server for a moment. Okay, so I use, uh, I use Dragon uh, Medical One, which is light years better than Dragon Naturally, uh, Dragon uh, Professional. So uh, it's, granted, it's 99 bucks a month, but it is infinitesimally better than uh, the Dragon, in my opinion, the Dragon Naturally Speaking Professional version. So, but I couldn't have that on every single computer. I could, but it would just be kind of a logistical nightmare. Do I have to get like, now, now do I have to get six different mics to, to, you know, to move it around? So what I opted to do, because I didn't want to go through that hassle, because it would have been a real pain in the you know what, is I put it on a server and I virtualize that environment so I can just literally pick up my phone and dictate it into it regardless of where I am. So that's an example, a little more in-depth example of why I created that workflow the way that I did, because now the tech is serving me as opposed to the other way around. It's it's very important for people to to hear that because I find that as doctors we might be you know somewhat uh, versed in tech, but when someone is considering opening a DPC and you know already has fears because they don't have an MBA, designing right. the thing to, to help them rather than to hinder their practice is is something that can can be a, a, a big speed bump and a big hurdle to to jump over. So. I, I hope that people hear your words and leverage that for their own practice. So I will offer number one: people can call me at any, call me, text me, email me at any time. More than happy to help. Um, but I will the I'll, I'll automate. I can tell you right now what my first question to whoever calls me is going to be: What's going to work for you? What do you already work well with? And then how can we mature that in a way that is doesn't freak you out or make you feel as though now you have to, uh, I don't want to say learn something new, but shift. Like what is going to work for you? 
If you're an iPad person, it's not going to do any good for you to get a desktop, as an example, because that's not what you do. If you're not an iPad carrying person, it's not going to do any good for me to tell you, go get a bunch of iPads and use this whatever product, because that's not going to work for you. So this reemphasizes my point. It really has to be, because you, your juju is going to be different than my juju. It just is going to be. My, my interaction with patients would be very different than yours. And not one is not better than the other. It's what makes you you and what makes me me. So uh, I'm I'm not an iPad person, even though I use them. I'm not. I don't take it. I don't take a computer into the patient room with me. I I don't um, because that's not me. And and forcing forcing myself to do that would be more work than it's worth. Uh, now other people can do that, and that's fine. Again, what works for them. Earlier, you you mentioned if you could do DPC, anyone can. Do DPC. <laughs> Anybody can do it. Right. When you have medical students. Uh, in your clinic, when you have other residents contacting you, when you have uh, conversations with residents in the hospital, what are some of the fears that you hear from other people considering DPC as a future? Sure. The biggest fear I hear from the residents is I'm going to have this enormously, this enormous outstanding medical school debt that I'm going to have to overcome. So DPC is not an option for me, which is a complete farce. It's a complete myth. So that's number one. Number two is I don't really feel like I'm, I'm I, I don't really think I can go into private practice without having some other support, uh, i.e. attendings around me, to which I respond back. Well, then you should really be doing more now because at some point the umbilical cord is going to be cut. And the, sometimes the most important skill we learn as physicians is to stand there and do nothing, but we stand there. And you're going to have, that's a, that's a life skill outside of being a physician that you're going to have to really learn. Um, so that is number two. Uh, and, uh, and number three is kind of along with that. They don't want to lose co collegiality. They want to stay in their little, their little cheerleading club. And they, you know, they want to have a hundred people in the office and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and I dispel the first myth fairly quickly, the financial, um, the, the financial piece. And I, I put a rate out on, I, I used to keep a spreadsheet and I found it, now I find it's more, uh, more Im impactful to handwrite it out, to show them. Actually, you, if you want to pay your school loans off in 20 years, then go work for the hospital. If you want to pay your school loans off in half that time, then go into DPC. It really depends on how long you want to, how, how long you want to take. So, um, those are by far the three things that I hear from the residents. What I'm hearing from students, interestingly, is, what does the future of medicine look like? Quote, unquote, I thought we're all moving to single payer system. So DPC won't really matter in the future. Or what's, you know, we've got non-physician uh, providers, practitioners that are replacing family physicians. So why would I want to do family medicine when I'm just going to be replaced by, you know, a PA or an NP or, you know, the janitor or something. And I, and I get, I, I get, I get those sort of things. Um, what I buff it back is the future is what you make it. Okay. So let's, and I tell folks, we could, I could wake up tomorrow morning and we have a single payer healthcare system. It won't, it won't affect my practice at all. In fact, it'll be the best marketing for it because we have several single payer healthcare systems that frankly suck. Okay. VA being one of them, not all VAs, but a large portion of the VA system is very dysfunctional. A large portion of the Medicare system is very dysfunctional. A large part of the state run, um, in our case, main care system is dysfunctional. Not all of it is, but a fair amount of it is. Um, so that's not going to, and I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm just, this is observational. Um, it's not going to, it's going to be the best marketing for me. So single pair can come, can come and go and DPC will still be around. Uh, so there's that. And then I say, well, you know, why do family medicine? Uh, because your patients deserve it. Why do general internal medicine? Because your patients deserve it. You really think, do you really think that someone who hasn't gone to medical school can truly replace you? The answer is no, they can't. That's what I'm really hearing from the medical students, uh, particularly over the past year. And they felt they have felt very um, uh, uh, detached from uh, the med from the from the physician community and from their medical schools. A lot of them have felt as though this whole COVID thing they've just been let out to dry. Uh, like put out the pasture, like we don't know what to do. So we, with the exception of a month when we did renovations, we were pretty much 
full capacity, mostly telemedicine for the first few months, but uh, we didn't we didn't skip a beat. And the students did it with me. So they would do video visits with me. They would do telehealth visits with me. And so I think that the ones that did that, a bit of, a bit of hope, you know, so that would be my call back to my brother, brother, brothers and sisters, is that if you're not taking medical students, take them. We need them and they need us. And we can't change the future unless we change the future. On that note, what is the best way for others to reach out to you after this podcast? Sure. Uh, okay. So uh, the office website is ocfm.com. We can be found on Twitter at OCFM. We can be found on Facebook. I hate Facebook, but uh, we can be found on Facebook at office.ocfm. People can just email me at jforbush at ocfm.com or they can send me a carrier pigeon or fax. But if you go to ocfm.com, you'll get all our address and social media links. And uh, my personal email address is jforbush at ocfm.com. Folks can text me at 207-735-7962. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Oh, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate you carving out some time. And it, I, I, I'm very humbled that you, that you asked me to be on. Next week, look forward to hearing from Dr. Lauren Hetty of Direct Doctors. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Tell your friends too. For more information on this episode and much more, please visit mydpcstory.com. Also, for the latest in DPC news, check out dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception. Conception.